That's classic. We bring you great laughs and a unique behind-the-scenes look at classic television shows and movies. I'm John Cato. I am an actor, voiceover artist, and also bring you an amazing insight as a moderator with over 20 years' experience in the television industry. All right. Today is a special day on That's Classic. Today, my guest host is none other than Ronnie Shell from Gomer Pyle USMC. Uh, what an honor. What a, what a terrific honor. He, Ronnie's a, just had an amazing career as an actor, comedian, voiceover artist, and uh, just man of many, many, many talents. So anyway, welcome, Ronnie. Hey, good to see you, John. Thank it's been you. A long so, time. It it's has, a long time. It has been a long time. Yeah, great. Uh, Ronnie's son, Greg, a uh, very close friend. I, both of us worked for Wick Thomas Harris uh, back on shows like Empty Nest and Nurses and all that stuff. That's where we met. I did a guest shot on Empty Nest. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. I did not know that. That's interesting. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I, play, I can't remember what I played, but I, I, I know it was a guest. I was the guest of the week. Oh, that's too funny. Yeah, that was uh, Tom Poston was on that show, wasn't it? Was that no, Tom Poston on Empty Nest? No, it was uh, another guy who passed away. Yeah. Uh, well, Tom Poston passed away, but this was another guy. Who, <laughs> I can't think of his name. <clears throat> Good actor. Yeah, his <laughs> name here. I'm, I'm blanking out. Well, yeah. we, wish him, we wish him well in the afterlife. That's, right. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, He's rich. <laughs> so um, why don't we start off? Just tell me, how did you actually, you know, get the role of okay. Duke Slater on, U on Gomer Pyle USMC? Well, to begin with, Andy Griffith uh, uh, thought Jim Neighbors was unique, mm -hmm. where he sang a certain way and talked a different way, and uh, of course was uh, Gomer on the right. Andy Griffith show for a while. So they were going to do a spinoff, <coughs> Duke Slater, uh, Duke Slater, that's me, <laughs> uh, 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 going to do uh, Gomer Pyle Marines, USMC. Yeah. So... I was touring around the country with a, 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 a very popular group at the time, folk group called the Kingston Trail. Sure, I know them. Yeah, and we were down in San Diego doing a show, <clears throat> and uh, Jim's and Andy's uh, manager, Dick Link, happened to see me on stage and liked what I did, and he said, listen, would you like to try out for, for a part on the Gomer Pyle show? And I said, well, what's the part? Well, and, and this is the unique part about the, the character. The Aaron Rubin, the producer of, of the Gomer Powell show, mm -hmm. had two main characters that were bigger than life, right? The sergeant and Gomer. Right. So he wanted to get someone to represent the audience, the viewing audience. In other words, that they would look at those guys and go, well, hey, my God, what's wrong with these guys? So that was Duke's character in the beginning. Wow. So I went and I auditioned, and uh, that's how I got the part. And, and, and uh, then that evolved into uh, more comedy for Duke later on. And uh, the rest is history. Yeah. Well, you were, you were terrific, and it did. Now, would you label that like the big break? You know, actors always talk about that. That was my big break. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had done... Uh, and after that, did the many, many guest shots and practically every show uh, on television. I think the only big show that I missed, and I, I regret not doing it, was MASH. I wanted to always do a guest shot on MASH, but I never did. I did a movie with uh, uh, Harry Morgan, mm -hmm. who plays a colonel, called The Cat from Outer Space, a Disney movie. We worked 14 weeks on that, and so I wanted to do a MASH, but it was canceled before I got Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah, I could have seen you on that in a heartbeat. You know, yeah, I got that. it's so funny uh, that you would mention the cat from outer space because just the other day, I'm a big Disney guy as well, oh. and I was watching the Strongest Man in the World, and you were the referee. I was a referee. That's right. That was my first movie. No, no way. That was my first full length movie. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I played the well, like you said, I played the referee in the end. Yeah. The end. Oh, yeah. Well, you did a good job. I mean, it was pretty obvious. I ended, I ended up doing six Disney films. Oh, wow. What, what, you, one, just, well, what other ones? Gus about the, uh, the mule that kicked the field goals. 
Yes. Remember? I, I the, do remember. I was the guy that went over to Europe to, to get the mule. And you got wow. there somewhere. And uh, and then I did, uh, let's see, that was Gus. I did uh, uh, Cat from Outer Space, where I played the, the voice of the cat. Oh, I didn't know you were the voice of the cat. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. In fact, <clears throat> I'm also in the movie as a sergeant under Harry Morgan. And the, the viewers, if you watch, the, ever see it, the viewers, the, the producers said, well, now his voice is going to be just like the cat. So they dubbed my voice, my regular voice. And so <laughs> the movie, that's not my voice. <laughs> the cat oh. is my voice. <laughs> That is hysterical. I'm going to I'm gonna go back and watch it. I, I literally saw it like maybe a year ago, you know, when this whole Disney Plus thing came out. Well, in the beginning, uh, uh, the producer, uh, the director, I can't think of his name, great guy, uh, he said, listen, Lonnie, will you play the voice of the cat till we get a, a sign a star to do it? Yes. I said, yeah. So it went 13, 14, 14 weeks, and finally he said, just play the cat when I don't need to get no big star. And that's how I, how it, <laughs> I love those Hollywood stories. Cause it's like, it's always something cool. like that, you know, cool. make a big deal. Well, let's go back. Let's go back to uh, Gomer Pyle. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, and I don't mind segueing cause I love all these stories. I think they're terrific, but mm -hmm. I had heard that uh, I believe it's ever Greenbaum. Is that, was, oh, is that yeah. his name? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That yeah, that's right. That he had actually based the show on an incompetent gas station attendant that he actually met in real life. I don't know. Did, did you ever hear that? No, I never, never heard that. Yeah, yeah. I had, I, I had. I, I knew that he was instrumental in the creation mm -hmm. of the character. He had yeah. a partner, didn't he? He had a partner. Uh, yes, he did. He had a partner. Uh, oh, geez, I sh I should know his name, but yeah, I can I can see his face, but I can't get the name. And I don't know if it was Levine. I can't, I, my brain just isn't going there. But I know, I know who you're talking about. You're right. He did have a partner. Yeah. Well, and then, of course, Sheldon Leonard, who the, the actor. He was, big, he was a big honcho. Yeah, that's right. He was the exec producer on that. I mean, that's amazing. He, he, uh, I worked for him not only on Gomer Pyle, but on uh, another show that I did uh, while I was doing Gomer, uh, Good Morning World. Uh, was that your show? He, he created that. He and Carl Reiner created it. Oh, no Good way. Morning World. Good morning, world. <clears throat> and uh, I left Gomer the third year to do the star, uh, my starring role mm -hmm. in the, uh, playing a radio personality on, um, on, on the show. And unfortunately, and it was a good show, but unfortunately, it was opposite, uh, it was CBS, it was opposite NBC when NBC first did first run movies. Mm -hmm. So that was a big thing in the United States. So every uh, Friday night or Tuesday, or whenever it was, people in America would look at the TV guy and said, who should we watch tonight? Cary Grant or Ronnie Shell? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that one. So right. Off after a year and a half. How did they not pick Ronnie Shell? You got to wonder. That's right. And you remember who played my girlfriend? No. Who? It was a go-go dancer out of Baltimore. She came out here and did a <clears throat> one special, and they she had a, 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 a comic, comedic touch, and so they hired her. I'll save the name. Gold, the, Goldie Hawn. That's right. She played my girlfriend. And it's sort of funny because we used to rehearse <clears throat> every night because uh, uh, in my apartment, I wasn't married then. You do the math, OK, John? <laughs> but she didn't like she didn't like to rehearse she thought she'd get stale wow after about three weeks i said goldie you're never going to make it because you don't have the stamina and the obedience watch me i've been in this business four years and i know what i'm doing i'm, I'm a pro you're not going to do it a year later, she won the Academy Award for Cactus Flower. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. So there you go. Yeah. Goldie. Wait. Talk about comedy gold. Yourself, Goldie Hawn, Carl Reiner, Sheldon he, he Leonard. Directed, he directed uh, about half of the, the Good Morning World because he, <clears throat> he was the big producer. Right. 
Wow, that's just amazing. I mean, that's a shame. That's a real shame that it got it got scheduled at that time because that just yeah, sounds like a terrific you never show. Watch it. Sometimes it's on reruns. Like it's very well done. Mm -hmm. Not just because I've seen it, but the, the the writing the writing is is like Dick Van Dyke type. Yeah, Carl. Right. I, I will definitely look it up. I maybe yeah. they have it on YouTube. I, I I'm not yeah, sure. I think it's that's, on that's pretty cool. uh, Antenna TV. Antenna TV. In I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to check it out. Sounds yeah. sounds good. I I'd love to say I'm the the master of knowing all the networks, but I don't. No, I don't either. <laughs> yeah. Um. So tell me this. Did um, you so you you did that show and then you came back. Is that yeah. correct to Gomer Pyle? Yeah, I was very lucky because by by that time, uh, Andy Griffiths and Jim Neighbors' manager Dick Link signed mm -hmm. me. So I was a, in that in that realm and. Yep. Uh, so Dick Link said, well, now that Good Morning World's canceled, I want, I want to get you back in. It's almost wow. out. So I came back as a corporal, corporal, corporal Duke Slater. I was very fortunate. Oh, unfortunately, very. Yeah, unfortunately, we had to, to uh, release uh, the sergeant's sidekick, Roy Stewart, who was a very good actor. But mm -hmm. uh, that's the role that I took over, and he was released. Wow, wow. Now, so... Now I understand when the show uh, when the show came to a close was that because is this correct that Jim Neighbors wanted to he wanted to sing more and he yeah. wanted to do more so he went and he got that variety show. We were offered two more years. Wow, that had been seven years, <clears throat> and uh, by CBS and Jim said no no I want I want to I want to sing, so they offered him <clears throat> a variety show one hour variety show. And he said, well, okay, I'm going to take Ronnie Shell with me. And uh, Frank Sutton played the sergeant. Right. So the three of us were, did the show. And uh, <clears throat> we were on two years. Uh, and it, it was a very successful show, except the, uh, the head of, of, of CBS at the time, he just passed away recently, Freddie Silverman. Yeah, sure. Very famous. He did not like... What you call the hick shows? All oh, right. We're, are just, we talking? He just canceled us out when we were. We we beat the Carol Burnett show. We beat the Glenn Campbell show. We beat uh, the only guy who beat us was Flip Wilson. But um, wow, a big hit, and uh, that ended that after two years. Very was, was that when you say hick uh, hick shows? Was that show is kind of like um, Petticoat Junction, Beverly exactly. Hillbillies? Same year, same year we were canceled. Petticoat Junction was canceled. Uh, <clears throat> an Andy Griffith uh, show was canceled. Every you name it. Oh, Beverly Hillbillies. Mm -hmm. Every any any what you call a hit show was off. I mean, if you look at like today's movie, yeah, today's landscape, and the audiences you were attracting, people would have thought he was insane. <laughs> I mean, I mean literally. Those you were know, massive it's, hits. It's an interesting thing because <clears throat> during the off season, I would go back and do clubs, nightclubs. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a stand up comedian. And we were extremely popular in the Midwest and the South. Hmm. And uh, that carried our, our, our ratings to the highest. And uh, the East Coast and the West Coast. They never, they, it was almost like, oh no, we, we never watched that show, the heck show. Yet, <laughs> yet we were popular there too. How interesting. When you were on the, uh, I guess the nightclub circuit or whatever, was, was that uh, like, cause you had been obviously, you were discovered in essence yeah. doing, doing comedy. Was that a, a huge boost to you on the road? Like, were you playing bigger venues? Did that, how was that? What was the effect of Gomer Pyle for you? Not really, because <clears throat> I worked for 50 years in Vegas. Wow. And I was always opening for big stars, Tony Bennett, Carol Burnett, uh, Glenn Campbell, and wow. Wayne Newton, people like that. And uh, even though, you know, I, I was on this big hit show, I was still, in to Vegas, I was still uh, the opening act. And that was fine with me. Oh sure. I always, I always would say if a place was packed, I'd say I told you I'd pack them in. If it wasn't packed, I'd say, well, don't blame me, blame Ken Campbell. 
<laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Always have an excuse. How was, uh, by the way, looking back, uh, you know, once again, I guess we'll just keep re revolving around Gomer Pyle. But I am, I am curious because you, you've had such an incredible career. What, what was it like working with like Wayne Newton and Glenn Campbell? What were, what were they like? Great. Uh, it's interesting. Of all the singers I ever worked with, and I worked with most of them. Mm -hmm. I worked with Sammy Davis Jr. Um, wow. In Hawaii, and uh, oh. Uh, Helen Reddy. Oh, yeah. Passed away recently. Yes. I mean, people like that. <clears throat> and the one act that, 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 that I used to do my act and race around, sit down and watch him every single show was Glenn Campbell. He was just perfect singer. Wow. Great. That was my favorite, my favorite singer. I, of course, Frank Sinatra, but I never wanted to meet Frank Sinatra because I was scared I'd be disappointed. Yeah, he had yeah. such a tough reputation. Yeah, know? he did. He had he had a big one. Was Glenn uh, also uh, nice as a person? Yes, he he would rather tell jokes than sing. Interesting. He was from Delight, Arkansas, and he was from a big family, and so he he was country. He was real country. Mm -hmm. But he could play guitar like you wouldn't believe, and you know he <clears throat> he did he did his guitar. In uh, sessions with the Beatles, wow, Capitol Records, as a, as a guitarist, he was good. Yeah, no, I I I, I got to know him pretty well, and uh, of course he yeah, was notorious with women. Uh, yeah, but uh, we, we we got along great, and uh, I was sorry that he got the Alzheimer's and forgot everything. Yeah, that was rough. I know he had that farewell tour, and I know that that That's went right. over. Uh, quite well, which was a, a great way to be able to leave, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah without a doubt. Well, let's look back here. Um, I know that uh, you you also did, you did something. I went online, I, I did a little like looking around or whatever, and I saw that you had done a, you had hosted a uh, a Gomer Pyle outtakes. Uh, they, you, they had the outtakes behind you and you kind of commented, how did that come about? And how, how did you get a hold of the outtakes? <coughs> Jim Neighbors had the only copy of outtakes, which he got from the directors and producers over the, the course of the, the four years. And uh, and uh, when I was touring with him, he would show those. The great the audience loved him. Oh, and yeah. So, and so when he sort of semi-retired, he gave, he gave the, the film to me. And so I started using them. And, and when I continued working nightclubs in Vegas and around, I would show those every night. They were very popular. And uh, that's how I got hold of them. That's amazing. That really is. Now, obviously, you can't talk about Gomer Pyle and not talk about Jim Neighbors. They're, they're, they're so, oh, yeah. yeah. Sure. What, what, you know, Jim uh, has a reputation and everything that I've read, everything I've heard of just a super nice guy. What, what was it like? Probably the nicest guy I ever worked with. Hmm. I and and all those years that I worked with him, I never saw him angry at anyone. Uh, and you know, he had the right to be. Some of these clawing uh, fans of his were, were escaped. And I think you probably heard that, which probably was true, that he was gay. Yeah, I had heard he got married uh, very yeah, late in his life. He did toward the end. He married a, a, a fireman out of Detroit, a good mm -hmm. guy who, who was very butch. I would call it butch. Wow. Women. Sure. And they were living in Hawaii, and uh, but he always kept that a secret, not a secret, but he just that was his private life. He never yeah. took one to me, right? Ever. But uh, but I he considered me one of his best friends, and I considered him one of my best friends. Good guy. You know, he was a he was from Sylacauga, Alabama, which in Indian uh, an Indian word meaning bat poop. <laughs> but uh, he, <clears throat> he he uh, uh, he never ever came on to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got you. Well, you know, 
you know, Ronnie, I, I don't know. Are, 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 were you good, good looking enough? Who knows? Yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so um, I have uh, one other one that I, I was curious about. This is just a personal one for me because I was such a huge Marx Brothers fan. Oh. Is I, I had read you back in 1959. You did a You Bet Your Life with Groucho. How it happened was <clears throat> I was working a, a nightclub in uh, San Francisco, my hometown, mm -hmm. uh, called Purple Onion. Mm. And on the bill, fantastic bill, was the Kingston Trio and Phil Stiller. Wow. And it was Phil Stiller's debut. And so John Goodell, who, who produced uh, You Bet Your Life, sent George Fenneman. Remember George Fenneman? He oh, of course. Fan. Very famous. He was from San Francisco. Oh. And he sent George up to, to get Phyllis to do the show. And he saw several shows and they signed her. And while he was up, he said, saw me and he said, hey, I'd like to get you on, on Groucho Marx too. And I said, good, I'll do it. And so that's how I got on. So I got on two weeks after Phyllis, thanks to uh, uh, mainly uh, uh, George. So what was that like for you? I mean, obviously, so, what was so, it? Thrilling. I was scared to death that Groucho was going to, uh, you know, uh, put me down or something like that. But <clears throat> when, uh, when we were, were rehearsing, I was, I was saying to the producer, you know, I'm a comedian. I, I may, may get very funny during this. And he said, <laughs> I'll never forget he said, Okay, I'll remember one thing. This is the Groucho Marx show. It's on film and you can be cut out. So don't be funny or <laughs> <laughs> That kind of says it all. Was yeah, that one he, of those? He, those played, he treated me good. He treated you good? Great. And then I, about uh, two years later, I did the Carson show one night and uh, he was in the audience and he remembered me and was very complimentary. He was in the audience? In the audience, yeah. Just came to see the show. Oh wow, wow! Was that was that for you? Like, because obviously, I mean, you would have you would have grown up with some of the Marx Brothers movies and all you yeah. know all that stuff. Was that for you one of those those like high aha moments? Uh huh. It was a high point. It was a high point, and uh, uh, relatively speaking, think about it. I never really did anything bigger than that throughout the years. But you know, and look in hindsight. Since Groucho Marx, their popularity waned, uh, but it didn't for me. It was it was a high point. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm still a Marx Brothers fan. I still yeah, anything from Animal Crackers to oh, yeah. uh, you know, I, Night at the Opera. I mean, every one of them. I I love it. You know. Yeah. Um. So when when you um uh, I saw a book by the way as well that it was Gomer Pyle says hey, and I understand no, no. you did the. Yeah, you did the foreword to it. Yeah, yeah, it just came out uh, two months ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very thrilled because uh, I did the foreword and then I'm in the, you know, throughout the, the book. I'm the only living person left from the Gomer Powell show. Oh my gosh, is that- Everybody else has passed. Wow, wow. The sergeant died about, uh, he died at, he was 60 when he passed away. Frank heart, Sutton. Heart attack. No, back okay. in, the, he was in Shreveport, Louisiana doing a play and he peeled over in the dressing room. That was, <clears throat> that was him. That was a great loss. Great actor. Were you close with Frank? Uh, not really. I mean, we got along. I never had a, a, a discouraging time with him, but he, he was not what you'd call a comedic actor. He, mm -hmm. he, and he was the first to admit it. He said, you know, I'm doing this show for the money because uh, I, I, I'm not that good as, as com, 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 comedy. And if mm -hmm. you see the show and rerun, you'll notice that he, he was uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, and, it, I, and ironically, I think that uncomfortable quality kind of played to the comedy. Could be. Yeah, very you know? well. Yeah. Very well. I heard I that. It. You what? I loved it. I loved all those characters I played. Oh my gosh! It, come on, you you've got a dream dream career. Um, I understood though that that makes a lot of sense about the fact that he didn't like comedy because I understood that when you guys went to the Jim Neighbors Variety Special, he actually they started pulling back on him because he was he was kind of, you know, feeling kind of stiff. 
on that show. He was stiff during the, the Jim Neighbors Hour in two years. Yeah. Two years. He was. He never really relaxed that much. Uh, but he loved doing it because of the money. He got great. He got rich on that. And, <clears throat> and uh, we had good times. Uh, uh, but he never really adapted to uh, the, the kind of comedy we did on the Neighbors Hour. Right, right. What about, you know, there were a lot of guest stars that were on the show, and then also recurring. I know that Alan Melvin uh, who played, uh, what, Sergeant Hacker? Sergeant Hacker, right. Yeah, and probably a lot of, a lot of our, our listeners would know him as Sam the Butcher from Brady Bunch. That, that was another biggie. But, he, was also, he also, in the, uh, the later uh, show about uh, uh, the one with Carol O'Connor. Uh, All in the Family? But then the spinoff of that. Oh yeah, Archie Bunker's place. He Archie Bunker. He was regular on Archie Bunker's place. He was a good guy. He uh, he he blended right in to the Gomer Pyle show because because he was always putting down the sergeants. <laughs> right, right. Uh, dueling sergeants. <laughs> yeah, it was a great idea. Yeah. What what about the um the sets? Because I always. You know, look, I grew up primarily watching them in reruns, but they were on constantly. I come back from school and I, I mean, I've seen probably every, every episode of Gomer Pyle, but it, when my memory goes back, it's always in that Sergeant Carter's office area or the bunkhouse. Right. What, uh, how many sets were there? Uh, probably three. One, the Sergeant's office. Mm -hmm. Two, the barracks. And three... The, the location when <clears throat> we would do a one show a week and the first uh, day we would go out to a place called 40 acres which was out in culver city and it was out was outside they had quonset huts and and uh, they also did uh, a couple other shows and we'd spend one day out there doing all the exteriors hmm. and um, in fact uh, one of the show, there was another a couple other shows that they were doing at the same time, the one about the uh, the prisoners, uh, with the well, I don't know, World War Two prisoners. Uh huh. Oh, was it a movie or a no, Hogan's Heroes? Hogan's no. Heroes. Yeah, they yeah. did Hogan's Heroes out there. Yeah, and, and uh, a couple others, <clears throat> and we'd go out then one day and do the exteriors, and then Thursday and Friday we'd do the interiors, either in the office or in the barracks. Or on location somewhere. I got gotcha. you. And uh, that's how they do an episode, half hour episode. Now, I read this also, and I don't know if it's true, but I heard that uh, Camp Pendleton was used at times. Just, for in, just in the opening. Just in the opening. You know where they're marching. Right, 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 right. And that was before I signed, so I didn't care about that. <laughs> <laughs> you would say, hey, is that you in the background? I'd say maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't signed till after a week uh, of the first show. Wow. So here's here's a question too. Uh, and you know, like I said, I did the podcast with your son Greg for uh, the Andy Griffith show. A lot of the um, the stars from Andy Griffith, I know uh, Andy was on. I think Goober was on, and mm -hmm. B was on. Uh, I'm connected with the Andy Griffith show, did our show. That's correct. Even Robert Howard. Howard. What was that? Ronnie Howard. That's right, Ronnie Howard. I forgot about that. He was on there too. The one I noticed that was not was Don Knotts, and I know Don was a very close friend of yours. What well, uh, why was he, he not very, on? Yeah, he and I had a very good relationship. Uh, <clears throat> what happened was that Don, after he quit Andy Griffith, was signed mm -hmm. to Universal to do movies. He did what Shakiest Gun in the West. And, and oh, the Ghost and Mr. K Chicken. And right, right. The love god astronaut, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then <clears throat> it just he just didn't get around to doing the, 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 the I, nothing against it, he probably would have done it, but his contract precluded him from uh, from doing the show. I, I got to know him through uh, was through Andy, and then um, he and he and his wife, Don and his wife became very close friends with my wife and I, and uh, we were with him right up to the, <clears throat> to, to the very end. Mm. And then when they, well, after he passed away, they held a 
be, be uh, show in his honor in his home state of uh, West Virginia. I don't oh, know, wow. I've been there somewhere. And I was, I was the host for that. Wow. Going for me. What was, well, you know, how, how do we not take that moment? How, what was Don like in, in real, real life? This will thrill, this will surprise you. He was great with women. He was a lover. <laughs> yeah. If he got caught, in fact, he got caught the time, his wife at the time, not the, the letter, what, he tells, he used to tell this story. Um, <laughs> his wife <laughs> was a jogger. And one morning she got up and she was jogging up the hill and she goes past this car and in the car was Don and some girl. <laughs> I had heard that women loved him. Oh, they loved him. He was a lover, I, I, you know, and uh, very successful with the ladies. Isn't that funny? Yeah, Completely yeah. the think? opposite of Barney Fife. But I think, as I said, when I did that, the, the, mem the uh, tribute, uh, of all the people in television, that was one character that would never come back again. It was, he was unique. And when he went, that character passed. He was the best. I still watch, uh, where I live here in LA, the uh, <coughs> Andy Griffith shows on eight to nine. And uh, I still watch just to watch him do his, his thing. Wow, that is great. That is great. Yeah, he's. You know, even when I talked about the show, I mean, not that Andy Griffith isn't iconic, but you are absolutely right. It's like you can't even think of the Andy Griffith show and not absolutely. think of Don Knotts as Barney Fife. Once, once he left, the Andy Griffith show was not the same to me. Right. You know, they did, they did a couple of seasons without him. And then uh, Ken Berry came in <clears throat> and sort of replaced, but not, you can't replace Don Knotts. No, you can't replace Don Knotts. And, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I had, well, even during that podcast, I was saying that I, I think Don felt bad because he, he only, I heard he only took that five pitcher deal because uh, he had been told by Andy that when, once we hit season five, we're going to end this thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's true. I forgot about that. That's true. But um, uh, he and, uh, he and Andy remained good friends right to the end. Uh, he, he had an a illness, I can't remember what it was, but about the last year, he was, he was very ill. And uh, in fact, he, he was, a, he was a, and, and you can see that when you see the character that he played. He was a supreme hypochondriac. Oh, he God. always thought he was, had some, some terrible illness. And finally, he did get it. <laughs> right. But it took a long time till he did. Yeah. That's that's you know, the I, think was, I think he was eighty-two when he passed. But I remember one time uh, he was in the hospital with his uh, made-up, or he thought he had something. And Andy said, "Come over. Don wants to say hello." So I went up there, <clears throat> and <clears throat> before I walked in, I said real loud, "So can I, have they told him the truth, Andy? Have they told him that it's over?" <laughs> he took it seriously. <laughs> 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 I love it. He well, very, and he wasn't very funny. What? No, he was not funny. He was not a funny man. Oh, that's really the bizarre. Character, the character he played, uh, usually the nervous, the nervous guy. Classic, classic. Oh, very classic. There'll, I mean, there'll never be another Don Knotts. Yeah, no, I agree. I totally it's, agree. It's with you. When he left, they, they used a, another friend of mine, Jack Burns. Uh, sure, I know who Jack Burns is. Jack was a good guy and very funny, but uh, it, it, he wasn't Don Knotts. Now there's there's funny and then there's there's special, and I think I think Don Knotts he took it into that special realm that yes, you you're, you're agree, not going to touch it. Yeah, I agree. That easy. So let's let's uh, going back. What about other guest stars? I understood Gavin McLeod was on the show. Um, any others that kind of came in? Which show are you talking about? Uh, Gomer Pyle. I heard. Oh, well, we had, well, the ones you mentioned, everybody from Gomer Pyle, everybody from Andy Griffith show was on as a guest. And then Gavin McLeod, uh, he played, uh, you know, Gavin McLeod. He, he was a guest. Uh, uh, Keenan Wynn. Oh, gosh. He was in a two-parter, very funny. He One of the in, greatest. 
Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Carol Burnett, of course. He did two of them. Mm. He had a special relationship with Carol Burnett. In fact, he was on the very first show every year of Carol Burnett's. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Every first season, the first show of every season, uh, Jim Neighbors was the special guest on, 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 on Carol Burnett's show. And uh, of course, I went along and uh, I had the pleasure of working with Carol in her only Vegas appearance at Caesars Palace. I opened for her. Wow. Very funny lady. Very funny lady. And, and the reason I opened for her is because Jim was originally scheduled to open for me. He lasted one day and he got the, what they call the Vegas throat, where you, oh. yeah, it, it, a hoarseness that some singers get. And he couldn't do it. So he called me in to take his place. And, and I was in there for the rest of the three weeks and I just had a ball. Oh my gosh, yeah. what a thrill. What yeah, we did some sketches. What's it like, uh, I mean, because, you know, as the average Joe here, I, I, I don't know what that's like. What's it like to open it for, like, a Vegas showroom like Caesars Palace? That's a big one. Well, you know, it, looking back, it, it was not, it was thrilling, but it was not that scary. Now I look back now and I say, Jesus, I opened for these guys. Oh, for Tony Bennett, for crying out loud. <laughs> And, and I, I would probably be scared if I did it in it today. But in those days, I, you know, I just did it. And wow, I, that's amazing. And I, like I said, I never had to worry about capacity crowds because they would always fill the room. Uh, right, right. Work with Connie Stevens and Jimmy Webb, you know, who did. Uh, oh, of course I MacArthur do. Parker Park. Yes. His debut in Vegas. We worked at the Desert Inn. And uh, well, if you can name anybody in Vegas. Uh, I probably opened for them, uh, opened with them. I don't like wow. them for them, opened with them. <laughs> were most of them, I mean, I, I realize that, you know, some of them were probably a little bit more private, but were most of them, w would you get the opportunity to get to know them a little bit? Yes. Because, yes. Yeah. The only, uh, the only two people in all my years in show business that I never got to know, because they were not that friendly, were uh, Diana Ross. Wow. Who, worked, who I worked with at the Sahara mm -hmm. and uh, Helen Reddy. No kidding. How interesting. How I'm interesting. Not at all. And, 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 but to show you, uh, Helen, I admired her scene. In fact, when, when our gig was over, I went out and bought an album of Helen because she was a great singer. Yeah, she was. Not, not friendly at all. How interesting. How interesting. What, by chance, did you work with Dean Martin? Never did. The only rat back guy I heard was Sammy. Sammy and what? what and Bishop, of course, I worked with many times. What was? Uh, well, you know what? I can't avoid this one then with Joey Bishop. I'm sorry. I have heard multiple times that he was not a nice guy. Is that true or not? That's what I heard, but he was always yeah. nice to me. I, I, to give you an example, I, I when I first worked in Vegas, uh, I heard that this sensation singer was Tom Jones. Oh God! Yeah, his debut. And I walked in, uh, just like in the, in the, I can't remember the, the nightclub. Anyway, it was a hotel. Yeah. Joey Bishop picked me out and said, come on, come, come in and sit with me. And he was that kind of guy. He was very, very nice to me. And okay. when I did his show, he was always complimentary. So, but I heard that he was tough. Yeah, I don't know why he got that. Because I've heard it multiple times and I, I, I agree. He doesn't come he across like that at all. I thought he was a good guy. Okay. What about Tom Jones, by the way? I, I happen to be a big never, fan of it. Not unusual. Me, but I was a big fan. Boy, when he started, he was sensational. I mean, he did all these moves that he had to cut back on. <laughs> right. It was so sexy for the girls. And uh, that night when he was making his debut, I can't remember where it was. And we all said it was myself. Joy Bishop and, and Danny Thomas, we all sat in the same room, and he was just sensational. Wow. What about Danny, speaking of, of legends? I did two shows with him. <clears throat> I did a, he did a show after uh, Make Room for Dad, Danny, Danny, where he was uh, a doctor. I can't remember the name of it. 
but I did a guest shot on that. He was very nice to me, and he let me do a little ad lib here and there. And so I have nothing. I heard he was tough, but not to me because I played his. I played his daughter's agent on that girl. Uh, oh, of course, Marlo, Marlo, Marlo Thomas. Thomas, Harley Peck. That was my character on that girl, and uh, so I, uh, you know, I was in as far as Danny was concerned because I was playing with his, his daughter. Well, I heard he was. I heard he was really tough when he came to producing. In fact, I'm pretty sure. Am I right on this that he was a producer on Gomer Pyle? Not a, no. He had a he had a financial part in it, but not. Oh, okay. He, Maybe he that's had, what it was. He had no. Uh, uh, I can't think of anybody who, who, other than the producer Aaron Rubin and, and uh, of course Sheldon Leonard and Greenbaum and Greenbaum and all his, the writers right. they they never intruded on anything we did. Well, I think it was a success. Right. Well, this is what I had, this is what I had read with Danny Thomas. This is where maybe his the toughness came in. I heard that CBS actually had threatened to um, go to, M uh, or no, he threatened, I'm sorry, Danny Thomas threatened to go to NBC with Gomer Pyle if they, because they were worried about the show at first, because I guess it was about, it's about Marines. And yeah. so they thought the female audience wouldn't be that interested. That's right, yeah. So he was, he threatened to them and he said, look, that's fine, we'll take it to NBC. And that's why CBS said, no, we'll green light it. We're good. I'm, I never heard that story. Yeah, I don't I think that's. He, I don't think he had the power to do that because the producer by that time was Aaron Rubin, and mm -hmm. he had sole uh, ownership of the show, and I don't think he was to listen to anybody but himself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I got you. Well, that's 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 the beauty of having you on the show is because we get to hear the the insights. All, all those years, I had a running gag with uh, Aaron because he, you know, he, he created Gomer Pye. He created the Andy Griffith Show. Yeah. And I would go up to him and say, when are you going to do my spinoff? Duke goes Navy. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Did, yeah. you know, a lot of, you know, one thing that I will say about Gomer Pyle in re researching the show is there's, you know, you can go online and Andy Griffith, there, there's, there can be a great deal of information, a lot of books. Gomer Pyle, not so much for, for considering you were number two, uh, in many cases, number two in the country, for, uh, not a lot of in below, we We're always in the top 10. Yeah. Always. Uh, it all came out in the, this latest book you mentioned. Gomer says, hey, uh, it, it has pretty well the whole story of the Gomer Pyle show from mm -hmm. the beginning to, to the variety show. Uh, the writer, the, can't think of his name right now, it'll kill me. But uh, Dennis, was it like Dennis Leary or something like that? Dennis, somebody? Uh, I don't remember his oh, last I name. Wait a minute, I have it somewhere. Oh. I mean, look. Because he'll kill me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh. Uh, while, you're, while you're looking, are there any, uh, are there any insights that you would... Um, you would say, you know, that most people don't know about the show. Oh yeah, there it is. Gomer says, hey, inside the manic and much love Gomer Pyle USMC. The writer was uh, Dennis Reese. Dennis Reese, that's it. I was thinking Dennis Leary, of course, the actor, but. Um, a lot so of research and, and there's, is there things in here that I didn't know about, you know, about all the characters. What would you say were some insights or some moments from Gomer Pyle that most people probably don't have, never knew? Well, um, during the first year and a half of Gomer Pyle, we had a, there was another character played by Ted Bessel. Oh, sure. Uh, from that girl. Yeah. Yeah. This was before that girl. And uh, if you look very, very closely, to all the things, we could never do a straight face interaction between the two of us. And uh, so and he played my other buddy. Yeah. But if you look very closely, you'll see us breaking up uh, on the Golden File show. And uh, so 
that was one of the things. That I like it. I like it. Yeah. I'll give you a, I'll give you a quick side note on a Ted Bessel story. Yeah. Um, so early on, this is actually around the time that I was with Greg at with Thomas Harris. I worked for a producer that uh, heard me, you know, we were always joking around and they ran into a problem. They needed uh, the a comedian to do the, uh, the opening or, or the audience. I can't think of it right now, but they hire comedians to be like the opening act during the, while they're yeah, shooting the pilot. For the audience. Yeah, for the audience. So you're there like, you know, three and a half hours while they're shooting the, the sitcom and you're trying to keep the audience rolling because they have audiences come in, audiences leave, audiences come in. Yeah. So she, she said to me, look, we're in a bind. We're shooting tomorrow and, and uh, you know, the guy we had set up fell out. Would you like to step in and do it? And of course, you know, as every actor knows when they say, can you, can you ride a horse? Of course I can. Sure. You know, so I said, sure, I'll take it. And I went, I went in and it was Ted Bessel directing it. Uh -huh. well, well, first of all, Ronnie, yes, I, I like to think of myself as a comic actor uh, as a background, but I am not a comedian. <laughs> so I didn't have, I had no material, had never done it before. And I'm standing there and I, I have to come up with things out of the air. I didn't know I'd be on for three and a half hours. You know? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, no break. So, so one of my lines would be, of course, I would go and ladies and gentlemen, at, you may not realize it, but our director is none other than Ted Bessel, Donald from That Girl. Well, you know, they have different audiences coming in. So I'm, I'm saying this probably, I don't know, four times. Suddenly the, uh, the assistant director calls me over to the railing and I lean down and he goes, hey, uh, John, uh, Ted really doesn't want to be known by that as much anymore. <laughs> so can you, can you just let that part out? <laughs> well, that like Ted. yeah that that killed about that killed about 25 percent of my act so well, the other great thing is they had a a uh i can't think who it was a star they they, they ran out of a star to do the the uh warm-up it's called the warm-up yeah that's it thank warm you the warm-up yes yeah. as as you look back do you consider yourself uh more of a clean comedian or what what was anything open game what was your thing i was in between mm. i was not against doing a a little off color if it was hilarious <laughs> yeah if i thought something was really funny i would do it uh, but for the most part i didn't uh, i didn't seek out a, a blue material and uh, it worked for me because uh, sometimes there were clubs and hotels that didn't allow you know dirty comedians so i, I looked out in that area would you have to adjust your um your yeah. your every order yeah some comedians wouldn't do it and it hurt them mm -hmm. uh, but i was i was one of these guys that i'd say yeah, tell me a little bit about these people and they tell me and i'd go and i'd adapt my act to them i'm a I learned my lesson one time when I was uh, working at a place called the Tidelands in Houston. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, Governor Orville Faubus was the governor of Arkansas, and I was putting him down on my act. Yeah. He was a segregationist. And I came off stage one time in, 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 in Houston, and the guy was going to beat me up. Oh, wow. He was a big fan of Faubus. And I had no out. I don't know, I'm just kidding. I didn't just, and uh, it was about that time I said, I'm not going to do this stuff if it, if it offends, uh, offends people. Like when I worked in Chicago at the Palmer House, I worked there oh. a couple of times, but uh, uh, I did some stuff on, on uh, daily? Hoffa. Hoffa. Oh, Hoffa. And two guys came in and went to the Bruce and said, Hey, uh, we like this Ronnie show, but we don't like him doing Hoffa stuff. Tell them to cut it out. I cut it out. <laughs> I bet you did. And that's a great venue, the Palmer House. Man. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I adapted to whoever, whoever I, was, I was working with. I got you. Well, going back to to uh, Gomer Pyle, and then we'll I guess we'll 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 try and wrap this up. But it, I, I mean, I could talk to you for hours. But oh. the the Gomer Pyle, um, I heard that they actually the the. Uh, Marines were actually so proud of the show that they allowed you to use actual real military equipment. Is that true? 
Yes, I did. We had a, uh, what you call a, a special colonel assigned to the Gomer Pyle show to make it authentic. Wow. And he would, uh, he, if you watch the show, that was during the Vietnam War. Right, right. There was no mention of the, uh, of the Vietnam War in, in five years of doing yeah. the show. Not one mention. And that You're was right. the height of it all. And uh, <clears throat> so it was uh, sterile in that area of, uh, of controversy. And uh, so in answer to your question, what was the question? Well, the fact that you get, well, no, actually, it makes a lot of sense in regards to that. I see where you're going because of the fact that it was so sterile in regards to the Vietnam War. The Marines and just the government were like, sure, go ahead and use use our equipment. Yeah. You know, because well, they, 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 bad. They, made, they made Jim an honorary, uh, I think, corporal or something like that mm -hmm. in Hawaii later in later years when he had retired and moved it <clears throat> to Hawaii. And uh, so they were, they loved, they loved the, the show. Was that? Um, was I'd, that meet guys, I'd, I'd meet ex-Marines and they'd say, hey, Ronnie, Semper Fi, which is Semper for Dallas, meaning something with the Marines. And uh, they were always plus, they were always plus. So would you? I had, I had been in the service, the real service, uh, prior to doing Goma Pi. I was in the Air Force uh, during the Korean War. That so I, knew pretty, I knew pretty well about the military, and uh, I tried to play my character close to, to the vest. The yeah, my, my, uh, my father was also in the Korean War, so I, I, I know I've got a lot of respect for that. I, I, you know, it's funny, Ronnie, until just now when you said that, I never really put together the level of respect you did show it, because when you're in the show, your uniform always looks perfect. Yeah. Perfect. And somebody that would not have had that background might have allowed a slip up here or there. But even in the funniest moments, your tie, everything looks perfectly done. Yeah, I, 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 I remember that. I'm glad you, you noticed it. I, I did respect the service and the uh, because I was in the Air Force and I, I really had a good, that's where I grew up, right out of high school. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, uh, I never regretted those years. So I was always respectful of, of, of the armed forces. Yeah, well, that was, that was great. That was really great. My dad was in, in the Army. In the, was he drafted? He was, he was in the fighting, I believe they were called the fighting 27th, I wanna say, but he was in uh, the first uh, unit one of the first units that went over uh, to fight. Oh, wow. But uh, yeah, pretty intense, but he, he came yeah. back, he was fine, but he, he was pretty, it was pretty great. intense. That's great. Yeah. He's still around? He is not. Unfortunately, he passed uh, roughly eight years ago or so, but, uh, but yeah, was uh, always uh, very proud of his, you know, his service and his medals and. John, uh, it would have made the story complete if you said, no, he was, he was killed in action. Yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. Who would have known? Who would have known? Exactly. Take it to a whole nother level, John. Yes. <laughs> That's right. He would have loved that moment, by the way. Yes. yes. Um, so anyway, when you, uh, you know, uh, tell me this, as far as Gomer Pyle, now I know that you do Mayberry Days and you do some of this. Do people still, um, and, I, and I know you were on the Andy Griffith Show, mm -hmm. but do, when people come up to you, is it still more about Gomer Pyle or is it more about the Andy Griffith show when you're at Mayberry Days? Tell you the truth, both. Huh. Both. I did. I only did a couple of Andy Griffiths, but they remember, boy, they remember every episode. <clears throat> and so every year in uh, North Carolina, uh, where Andy was born, they have a tribute to him. Yes. And they have in this little town of uh, Mount Airy, where yeah. Andy was born, they have uh, a big convention three days and they get 35,000 people minimum. Wow. Wow. And, uh, and I go every year cause I, ha I'm one of the few, well, I think I'm the only remaining live guy that I, I have a night for that. So I can go and do an act. Wow. So I go every year and do my act and, uh, I meet all these people. So they're equally, uh, complimentary from my Andy Griffiths as they are from the Andy, from, from the gym, from Goma Pyle. Wow, that's fantastic. 
Well, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you let you go. I I I can't it's even about tell time. you what. It's about time. <laughs> I've enjoyed this. Oh I'm my. Good. My gosh, I, listen, Ronnie, this has been a pleasure. I have had so much fun hearing about this stuff. I This is stuff underneath I, I think I've wanted to talk to you about for years. So it's it's just a real, real honor. But uh, thank you for uh, yeah, being my honest. My pleasure. I hope I haven't uh, ruffled any feathers. But if I have, so what? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need Helen Reddick. I don't need Diana Ross. <laughs> That's hysterical. Well, okay. Well, listen, thanks again. And uh, I, w I look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you again soon. Good. And uh, you're in LA, right? I am. I am. Eight to nine. At nine o'clock on MeTV, reruns of Gomer Pyle. Oh my gosh. I did. I literally didn't know that. Okay. MeTV. All right. Very help. Very helpful. Okay, buddy. Thanks a ton. My pleasure. Follow us on Spotify and iTunes and leave us a review. Thank you so much.